so it's a digital music trends coverage of South by Southwest 2013 and I'm very happy to have uh, Brian Felsen here, a president of uh, CD Baby. So hi Brian and great to have you on the show today. How's it going? Hi, it's going great. Ple pleasure to be here. Alright, so it's the first interview with CD Baby which is crazy actually because the show's been going for four years and you guys for far longer. So uh, first of all, let's start with a bit, of, a bit of an introduction on the history of the company. When did you start out and how long has the company been around? CD Baby started in 1999 and it was started by a guy named Derek Sivers. Uh, who was a musician whose muse didn't ex or talent didn't exactly fit in with what the recording the record labels at the time were looking for so he found a way to sell his own music online and some of his friends were bands and said wow can you do that for me and he said sure and then soon he had over a quarter million friends yeah wow it's amazing and so you know city baby has been one of the sort of pioneering platforms for distribution of music uh, and you work in the physical and the digital market of course a lot of people uh, just think think of you as a digital distribution service but you also have a strong uh, and, and healthy uh, CD distribution service. Yes. Uh, so how has that been evolving in the past uh, you know, two or three years uh, in the balance between the physical and the, and the digital? Uh, it's been evolving in interesting ways because the digital, the physical CDs had been in decline for a while. So we have been doing all kinds of things such as sending to more streaming services, uh, doing deals with uh, different territories, with cell phone carriers, uh, sync licensing things, uh, getting people paid for YouTube. Uh, foreign royalty collection, but the strangest thing happened is that over the last year, year over year, our physical sales are up 25%. So that's something we never expected. And looking back on it, we can tell it's because of our deal with Alliance and because of our better algorithms and relationships with Amazon and people like Best Buy and Target and things like that. But we just did not expect that kind of a turnaround. Of course. And of course, the numbers coming out are, are great. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, you announced a, a week where you had a $3.8 million payout to artists. Uh, uh, in the various forms, you know, digital yeah. and physical, and you know, uh, last year you paid uh, over 50 million dollars uh, in 2012 to to artists. So that's it's, it's really it's a sort of growth, which is which is great in the music industry. You know, we don't get we get a, quite a few of those in the very new services, but not all of those in the in the services that are sort of historically pr present and, yeah. and around. Uh, so how do you maintain that? And you know, is it just like a gradual build up of relationships, like you like you said before? Uh, it's from everywhere. I mean, part of it we've now we've now paid out almost 300 million dollars to independent artists so a lot of it is just that while it, a lot of its diversification we're trying to find ways for artists to monetize their money in every which way so again from streaming new territories royalty collections sync physical digital a direct a fan our Facebook music store app there's like every which way an artist can make money in, in their music and get it heard and get it you know discovered in the watering holes where people buy music that's where we're helping artists to be so a lot of its development and part of its relationships of course of course and and you know now there's, there's a hundreds of different digital services there's so many and it's it's kind of a i guess it's a it's a hard choice to to understand really who you have to concentrate on uh, you know a company's time is not limitless so you have to dedicate resources to the services that you think are going to be you know, bringing money to your artists, of course. Uh, so, what's your take on that? And you know, and also internationally, how do you see services that m maybe not be on the radar for us in, in, in the in the US or in the UK? Um, well, we it's there's always a balance, right? I mean, I go to to festivals all over the world, just got back from Medem and just trying to find new territories and new services that have an interesting model that can make money for their artists. Some of them, which I know will not be in existence six months from now, I just won't do the deal. And some, you know, other companies will, and then they'll spend their resources and then the company will go under. Or some of it, the artists just make so little money, it's almost detrimental. But we found a way just from looking at, at companies overseas and people like Bloom and Yandex and all these new markets and things that we've been able to grow the streaming services in the foreign territories but still have our download sales and uh, and our physical sales go up so our point is to not cannibalize any of the more traditional venues yeah sure and city baby offers a you know a host of services like a lot a lot of services for artists and uh, of course the more services you offer that are personalized to the band and to to you know what they do, uh, the harder it is, of course, to support them and to to really give a, a personal support to the bands. And you have a lot of acts on the side. So how do you manage that that side of it? 
we hire people. <laughs> and we have like 46 customer service reps that answer the phone. One of the rare internet companies that answers the phone. So um, really it's just, a lot of it we just try and help artists help themselves. So we have a blog or helpful guides on things, parts of the music business that we don't even deal with, like touring and stuff like that. But we just want to empower artists to be able to create and make great art and have a sustainable life while doing so. Of course. Of course. And uh, you know, the backhand side of a service like yours uh, must have become really difficult to deal with in the last five, uh, four or five years uh, with all the streaming services coming into play. Uh, so, and of course the service has hundreds of thousands of, you know, of, of tracks, uh, it's, it's even more difficult. So uh, how, how do you build that part of it up and was it, was it tricky to find, a, to find the right way to really uh, account for and report on, on the streaming royalties? Yes, yes. Uh, the short is is that we screwed it up royally. Uh, there's really, we were going along merrily. We had a couple hundred thousand uh, um, artists and um, it, it, what happened was we, we were growing faster than we had projected and then we did a deal with Spotify and Spotify literally broke our accounting. It was like suddenly we had millions of lines of incoming stream going to uh, four decimal places after the penny and it was like it was total like all nighters all weekends just trying to be able to account for it all and you know now we have we have it we have probably the most robust accounting system in the industry we handle almost five million tracks um, and millions and millions of lines of streaming data which we can display every single one for our dozens of partners but man it wasn't easy <laughs> and uh, how do you find like the reporting side of course you know uh, reporting sales data for from a wealth of different services to artists can be tricky, uh, especially like to try and let them know, you know, if there's a spike uh, in a specific store or what's happening on that. Do you have like any way, uh, like graphically, to display that to artists? Uh, well, I mean, they have a centralized accounting dashboard where they can see all of their sales uh, by by uh, title and also by um, by retailer. So it's very easy for an artist to see what's going on. Of course, uh, looking at stuff like a radio for example uh, you know you, you have a service you have a link to, to, to a service also that offers some help on, on that front how, how do you see artists relating to, to, to radio these days physical radio is very interesting because um, it's uh, sort of in decline but it is an important way uh, for discovery but there are a lot of predatory companies out there which will you'll know, charge you thousands of dollars for packages to either print CDs and and send them out or to work radio and we've not found anything that's provided consistent value to the bulk of our artists so what we're about is enabling artists to really get discovered within one of our 850 genres and people who like to listen to them and then if that's radio great if that's in not if that's non interactive or if that's interactive online radio that's great we just want them to get out there and get get discovered and get paid and talking about um, locker services, uh, of course, it's kind of a middle ground between streaming and, and downloading. And we don't even know if they're going to be a, around for, for, the, for the long term. But um, uh, looking at the right now, iTunes Match is beginning to be a, a fairly relevant source of income. Uh, but it's, it's kind of hard to, I mean, I, I personally, uh, I've had a lot of conversations, but I don't, I don't have a clear idea of how it's accounted for and, and how it works. So how do you guys deal with that? Well, it's uh, for, for us, it's not a ton of money coming in from these. Amazon's got a good one. There's iTunes. Google's got one. Um, what most excites me about the cloud is not yet the revenue that's coming in from them, because the checks are small relatively. What I what I really like about it is that it's it's a pain-free, action-free way for artists to make additional money from their music, and also it takes an agnostic position as to whether the music was stolen in the first place. If the music was stolen, even if it was, if you're a subscriber and it's matched against their copy of it in the cloud, you're going to get a fraction of that for the play. And I just I think that's really cool. Yeah, of course. Hey, so you, you guys have a pro account as well, and uh, uh, it offers a host of other services, including uh, hookups with uh, collection societies. And uh, uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, how are artists uh, finding uh, registering with those? And uh, you know, do you find a lot of artists are uh, are not as savvy and don't actually register with stuff like Sound Exchange, for example. Sure. Well, some some of the artists, like a lot of times the bigger ones, are savvy and they can go through the trouble uh, and expense of doing it themselves. But a lot of our artists aren't savvy, and and we can do it for them for about the price of changing your oil in your car. And the point is that 
we, the artist shouldn't have to be savvy. The artist should be, be savvy about making great music and writing and producing and, and then trying to find a way to make a life so that way they could do more of that. So we're, we're there to take that hassle off of them. Yeah, sure. Um, do you have any anything to do with, uh, of course, you know, there's starting to be a bit of a crossover between, uh, you know, for example, um, sites that do crowdfunding for recorded uh, tr rec recordings and, and live uh, and also and so where does City Baby sit in the crowdfunding field? That you, are, are you guys interested in that and uh, and is there anything that you that you want to do in that space? We're very interested in it and we have links to and partnerships with uh, companies that do crowdfunding but we don't want to just insert ourselves as a, a, into the equation if we can't really add value so at this point there's so many cool developments that we're working on for artists to help uh, sell and distribute their music and so many new deals and partnerships that we can't, I, I don't want to just reinvent the wheel for crowdfunding and say, okay, yeah, don't go to Kickstarter, don't go to Indiegogo, go to us. For us, it's more like here, work with these guys, they're really good, it's really simple, so do that. Um, looking at services like iTunes, of course, uh, it's still got huge, uh, you know, influence in the sales uh, and in the industry in general. Uh, how are your relationships with, how's your relationship with iTunes? and? Uh, you know, I, I myself used to work at a, at a label and it was very, very difficult to actually get hold of them and talk to them and, and get them to do anything. So did, did, has that improved uh, on the customer service side? Uh, I mean, our relationship with iTunes is unparalleled. In fact, we're going to dinner tonight again. <laughs> we, uh, I'm in Cupertino all the time. There, We have, um, the thing is, not only do we give them the largest chunk of their catalog, um, but we also have the cleanest data and metadata, which makes them very happy. So we have a direct connect relationship, which gets us, our artists live within 48 or even 24 hours so we just they audit us and we you know they keep saying okay are there any tickets are there any problems with the audio problems with the metadata but we were number one among our peers in terms of the quality of our delivery it's great and, and, and do you feel like they're being uh, relatively open when it comes to featuring artists as well iTunes is going to feature who they're going to feature, so we can push artists to them, but the fact of it is is that if you win America, America's Got Talent or something like that, you're going to be featured, and for us, if there's an interesting story of an artist touring or that has a big bump in sales velocity or something, they'll feature it, and we let them know who we think is really good and who's up and coming, but they're going to do what they're going to do. They've got such a huge platform, and it's, you know, we can't, we can't just dictate who they're going to push. Of course. And do you feel like streaming services as well? Well, you know, I know quite a few of them have, you know, the aspiration to demonstrate that they can break artists as well. So, do do, do you find that they maybe uh, they are really looking for stories and looking for artists that they want to champion and push? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's ones uh, like even Rhapsody, which was the first, uh, is looking with their deal for uh, with Metro PCS uh, to push. Uh, musics and genres for that demographic. So they're, they're they're very interested in playlists and Beats is coming out with which is uh, with their new service and they're talking about curation. So they are interested, but not just breaking artists. These streaming services have a, another challenge, which is simply to break even. So it'll be very interesting to see how that all works out in the next couple of years. Sure. 2013. Uh, you know, any particular. Uh products or, or services that you're looking uh, at uh, as, a, as, as a, an area of interest for you uh, or is it more like an evolutionary process at this stage? No, uh, it, certainly more direct-to-fan tools, more uh, more international uh, and more deals. Uh, but it's uh, even though it's already March uh, in 2013, the music industry it changes so fast that even though we've got our roadmap and there's so many great initiatives on the t table which we have prioritized, going to these conferences and looking at what's happening does inevitably change that. And six months from now, it might be musical teleportation, you know, so it's really hard to say. That's great. Well, thanks so much for your time. And it's a cdbaby.com. You should go and check it out if you haven't heard about it. And thanks so much, Brian. Thanks a lot. It's a lot of fun.